I thought it might be useful to have a look at the origins and progress of two systems and then look at their prophetic outcome. The two systems are Israel and Europe. So let's have a look at Israel first. We know from the words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that God promised wonderful blessings would happen to Israel if they served God diligently, which they did for a time. However, if they forsook God, then God would bring severe curses upon them. Verse 1 reads, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the world. They did forsake God and worshipped idols, and did things that displeased God very much, seeing that God had held them and made covenants with them. So in verse 15 we then read, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So, if we now look at Ezekiel chapter 36, we read of God's long suffering, his goodness and his mercy to his people and to all those who serve him. He promises through the prophet but ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches, and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and ye shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply men upon you, and all the house of Israel, even all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be builded. Jesus, in Luke 21-24, then showed that Israel and Jerusalem's desolation would be only temporary. He says, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So that prophecy hangs upon the word until. Long before the time of Jesus, God had already given this prophecy in Ezekiel in the form of a vision where he was carried into a valley of dry, bo dry bones. Verse 1 of Ezekiel 37 reads, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out into the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Verse 3, And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And in verse 11, we are clearly told that these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. The bones were in a valley. They were in the lowest place they could be and were very dry. They had been there a long time, at least 2,000 years. And that word dry is related to the word yabash, meaning to be ashamed, confused, confounded or disappointed as failing. In AD 70, the Romans besieged Jerusalem, starved the people and destroyed both people and the city. Those who escaped were sold as slaves all over the world. According to the historian Josephus, the entire city was demolished, excepting three towers. Titus commended his soldiers and distributed rewards to them, and then dismissed many of them. This was the end which Jerusalem came to, and the slave markets were saturated. This was the start of this description of the dry bones. The Israeli archaeologists, digging in the area of Masada, 
actually found the bones of the rebels who had fought their last stand against the Romans. This was really the beginning of the prophecy. So we begin with the skeleton. In 1882, the first alia, known as the agriculture alia, is a term used to describe a major wave of Zionist immigration to Palestine between 1882 and 1903. These were the first Jews to migrate to Palestine, then controlled by the Ottoman Empire, and came mostly from Eastern Europe and Yemen. An estimated 25,000 to 35,000 immigrated to this area during that time, but some 40% to 90% also left Palestine a few years later. Those who were left could be described as forming the skeleton of the future nation of Israel. It was in 1897 that a Jew who lived in Austria became the leader of the Zionist movement in that area. His name was Theodor Herzl and he was a journalist. He played a critical role in the establishment of the modern state of Israel and wrote a pamphlet called Der Judenstadt, the Jewish State. This pamphlet helped to launch Zionism as a modern political movement in order to progress the establishment of a modern Jewish homeland. And this is described as the noise. He organized the first Zionist con con Congress in Baal, Switzerland. During the time of the First World War, in 1914, anti-Semitism became a political movement. This raised the hatred towards the Jews to the status of an ideological guiding principle to encourage political activity. It was based on a system that would stigmatise Jews and was represented to the people at the time as a threat to society. The anti-Jewish positions became socially acceptable and anti-Semitic excesses began to dominate everyday life. This was termed as the shaking. Shaking in this case means uproar, commotion, confusion, fierceness and even earthquake. All adjectives describing the attitudes of the people at that time toward the Jews. In 1917, the Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government during World War I, announcing support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. There was a population by that time of about 3%. It read, His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object etc. This was the first public expression of support for Zionism and had long lasting consequences. It greatly increased the popular support and later became known as Israel and the Palestinian Territories and today is considered a principal cause of the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, hence the sinews which gave quite some movement to the subsequent growth toward the State of Israel. Therefore, in 1922, the British Mandate for Palestine, from which the Balfour Declaration of a National Home for the Jewish People was to be established, was conceded by the Ottoman Empire following World War I, and came into effect on 29th of September 1923, with the United Kingdom as the administers. This put flesh on the sinews. It wasn't until 1947 that the United Nations Partition Plan or Palestine was proposed which recommended a partition of mandatory Palestine at the end of the British Mandate. On the 29th of November 1947 the UN General Assembly adopted the plan as Resolution 181 which really was the skin which then held everything together. Subsequently, in 1948, the State of Israel was proclaimed and breath was put into the nation and the, bo the body began to live. In verse 9 of Ezekiel 37, 
we see that these people had actually been slain, not just died of natural causes, which harks back to when Jerusalem was besieged and destroyed by the Romans. So in verse 14 we read of God's promise that he would put my spirit in you and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, then shall ye know that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. And verse 10, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an extremely, extremely great army. So today the number of people available for military service in Israel is over 3 million. I think that can be described today as an exceeding great army. Israel today is proud and has lots of armaments in which it puts its trust, but that will be its undoing. We read in Ezekiel 39.21 that God says, And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them, that's Israel. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. So although they are a pro progressive country, there is still an element of uncleanness and God will have to discipline them and remove it. Now, according to the parable of the Lord Jesus in Luke 21 verse 29 about the fig tree and all the figs and all the trees, we read, They now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Trees in scripture are symbolic of nations. The nation of Israel is represented by the fig tree. When Israel became a nation in 1948, there were 57 countries in the United Nations Assembly. Today, there are 192. So the nations have really shot forth just as Jesus said they would. The verse continues, verse 33 of Luke 21. When you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So what is the period of a generation? Well, some think it's 40 years, some think it's 50, some think 70, some think 100. Well, it's not 40 or 50 in this instance because those periods have gone. So if we then consider 70 years as a generation, the period allotted for a lifetime, and add 70 to 1948, we arrive at 2018, which just happens to be this year. So we wait in hope. By now, as Jesus has been given all power in heaven and earth, he's been working toward the day for his return for some 2,000 years. So I think there's little doubt that he knows exactly how long he has left and when he will return. <clears throat> For we know that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised Jesus from the dead. So this is the position today. We are very, very close to the return of Christ and the kingdom of God being established. Israel is alive and on its feet and their achievements since 1948 are indeed impressive. Now in scripture there is clear evidence that law, commandments and statutes were in force before Moses. We have the verse in Genesis 26 verse 5 where God said to Isaac, speaking about Abraham, that he would multiply his offspring as the stars of heaven, <clears throat> because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So God's laws were in force at the time of Abraham. We remember that some 300 years later, Moses was commanded by God to go up Mount Sinai and God would give him the Ten Commandments. 
Moses returned and subsequently wrote the first five books of the Bible. These books gave God's good laws which told the Jews how they should serve him, how they should treat their family, their friends, their enemies, their animals, their land and so on. Man was under command to walk in the way of God. However, this good divine advice God has given over the years has been distorted and ignored and turned completely around. In 539 BC, the armies of Cyrus the Great, the first king of ancient Persia, conquered the city of Babylon. But his next action marked what is believed by some to be a major advance for man. He freed the slaves and declared that all people had the right to choose their own religion. And he established racial equality. These and other decrees were recorded on a baked clay cylinder in the Akkadian language, known today as the Cyrus Cylinder. This ancient record has now been recognised as the world's first charter of human rights. It's translated into all six official languages of the United Nations and its provisions parallel the first four articles of the Uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The point is that his concepts were not the same as the laws God had set down through Moses. He said that all men have the right to choose their own religion Yet God says in the Bible that all men should worship him and him only. Cyrus also said there should be equality between all peoples. Yet we read in the psalm, Psalm 49 and verse 20, that man that is in honour and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. So in God's eyes, those who obey his good laws sets them apart from those who do not. So there is no equality there. So let's now have a look at Europe and the instigation and progress of its present systems. We read in the Bible about the beasts of Revelation chapter 13. These beasts are representative of what God classes as beastly human systems. These systems developed around the Mediterranean and Europe after the Roman Empire had broken up into ten kingdoms described as ten horns in the book of Revelation. The people who lived in Spain at that time were primarily the ancient Vandals in the 5th century who emanated from the swamp areas of Germany. They were Aryan Christians who believed in one God and persecuted the Catholic Trinitarians of Europe. However, a man called Gunthermund ended that persecution and recalled the Catholic bishops and clergy who had gone into exile. We read in Revelation 13 verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. This was the start of the progress of the first Catholic system called in Revelation chapter 13 the beast of the sea. It was in fact a Latin beast and Latin means it was Spanish and it was also partly French. So it became a Christian Franco-Latin beast which subsequently morphed into the beast of the earth. In verse 11 we read and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. This beast came about within Europe under the reigns of Pepin, the king of the France, Franks, and Charlemagne, his son. The word Franks is taken from the Latin word Francus, which means free, and these people had very strict attitudes to their own laws and rights of the individual. Their concept of progress was that with freedom, man would better himself. So, the themes that came out of this French European system were liberty, equality and fraternity. And again, in the book of Revelation, it's no coincidence that there is a verse 
in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13, which reads, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. This verse is actually telling us that they were unclean spirits, which were like frogs. And frogs in the Bible are classed as unclean creatures, not to be eaten. We can easily see the origin of that concept in the book of Exodus, when the Jews were in ancient Egypt. That's in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 3. The Egyptians worshipped the frog as a god of fertility. Therefore it was one of the plagues imposed on Egypt by God because of their false worship. The frogs got everywhere, even in the king's palace, and when they died and were collected into piles, they stank. Not only that, in spite of the awfulness of enduring all these frogs, the pharaoh at the time reneged on his word and didn't let the people of Israel go free, as he said he would. So the frogs not only came to represent uncleanness, they also represent untruths because Pharaoh lied to the people. So it was during the time of the decline of the Ottoman Empire, after the French Revolution, when these three frog spirits came upon the scene with the cries of liberty, equality and fraternity. So as we've seen, they are classed as unclean, lying spirit. It is a fact of history that the arrogance and control by this oppressive Catholic system actually exploited the common people of France, the serfs, robbing them of any kind of freedom, somewhat against the national spirit of liberty, and led to the French Revolution. And the Catholic system was destroyed, including many people many aristocrats and royalty by Madame Guillotine along with all its assets and its buildings which were sold. This spirit of revolution then spread throughout Europe as a noisome and grievous saw Revelation 16 verse 2 upon the men with the mark of the beast. That word noisome in Greek means worthless, depraved and wicked. In English it means having an extremely offensive smell. These spirits are the main ingredients of democracy. There was no democracy before the French Revolution. The Greeks were supposed to have invented it but didn't actually implement it. Since then it's found its way into the political hierarchy of most of the countries of the world to a greater or lesser extent and into the professing so-called Christian churches, just as the frogs did in Egypt. These are false ideas not to be believed by Christadelphians. We are counselled in scripture to remain separate from all worldly influences, one of which is democracy. Democracy Democracy is defined as the sharing of power between people of all strata of society all of whom are deemed equal with power. The problem is that most are not enlightened with divine wisdom and can only express the wisdom of the fleshly human mind with little or no respect for God and that the rule of the people in their mind is more politically expedient than the rule of God. So the lowest level of society can therefore get into power and control the minds of men with their erroneous ideas. This greater so-called freedom only leads to greater bondage of sin and the lowest level of behaviour is now the norm. Everyone must be allowed to do just as they like with no restraint. This is why we as Christadelphians do not vote because these are worldly institutions and we should have nothing to do with any worldly institutions. For we know that God, not man, rules in the kingdom of men and in voting we could be voting against the will of God and helping to appoint men who would rule after their own sinful hearts. We are therefore told to be separate from the world and all its institutions. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 We see then in man's achievements the words of King Nebuchadnezzar. 
Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honour of my majesty? There was no mention of God. He believed that man, and himself in particular, was the greatest entity upon the earth, until God showed him that actually he was just behaving like a beast, an animal. Therefore God put him out to grass for seven years, until he learned that God rules in the kingdom of men. Charles Darwin and his successors proliferated his false ideas of evolution with the concept that man basically is on his own and that this life is all there is. Even his arch enemy the Pope today defends the rights of man. Therefore all these false concepts have contributed to humanism, really the removing of any thoughts of God, the great creator, from the minds of men and putting man at the forefront. This is why there are so many problems today. As far as equality is concerned, as these concepts demand, the normal family is the most stable arrangement and is the best foundation for society. This is the pattern we should follow. But in today's society, the role of the father has become unnecessary. There should be a family hierarchy. The head of the family is the father, then his wife, the mother of his children, then the children. Today, largely because of social media, the role models are pop stars, singers, sports people, which in no way fulfil that role. Families today can be of any combination, there are no rules anymore, so children are confused, they have no boundaries. Fathers can't chastise their children anymore without becoming foul of the law. Human rights set the fathers against the children and they're considered equal. Women's liberation also diminishes the role of the father and therefore mental illnesses and stress of children and teenagers have now become significant problems for the medical community. The greatest example of fatherhood was between the Lord Jesus and his father in John's Gospel chapter 5 and verse 19 where we read the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for whatsoever he doeth these also doeth the son likewise. Jesus always obeyed his father in everything and there has been a huge explosion of knowledge which has also diminished the father's authority. Children learn things today that wasn't even learned by their fathers in university. This social media which millions join once again is a means where people can show their wickedness without being called to account. This so called freedom is now far away from the good laws of God and are breaking up the whole fabric of society. Just a short video on its effect. You know, we now know that many of the major social media companies hire individuals called attention engineers who borrow principles from Las Vegas casino gambling, among other places, to try to make these products as addictive as possible. That is the desired use case of these products, is that you use it in an addictive fashion because that maximizes the profit that can be extracted from your attention and data. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. That is truly where we are. The way the technologist Jaron Lanier puts it is that these companies offer you shiny treats in exchange for minutes of your attention and bytes of your personal data, which can then be packaged up and sold. What happened is that the attention economy and this race for attention got more and more competitive. And the more competitive it got to get people's attention on, say, a news website, the more they need to add these design principles, these more manipulative design tactics, as ways of holding on to your attention. You don't realize it, but you are being programmed. Social media tools are designed to be addictive. So reading God's Word is much more profitable. So all this tells us that present humanism democracy and the so-called rights of man tell us nothing about God's promises of the kingdom to be established upon this earth. 
They think their utopia is that of achieving a just society where people enjoy their rights to vote and have freedom of speech, etc., and can do as they like so long as it doesn't affect another. And as we can see, it's not working. It only leads to more violence. Everyone wants to have their own rights regardless of others. And fraternity in the world is not working, as we are now surrounded by violence and wickedness in every section of society. We read again in scripture that the earth is already under a curse because of sin, and this should bring all men to realise their position before God and to seek his forgiveness for their sin, so they can be forgiven and have the possibility of being in God's kingdom. God told us that the first commandment was to love him more than ourselves and all others, and to love our neighbour only as we love ourselves, and in doing that we obey his good commandments, and specifically we are told not to love the world. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 There is no point in loving the world and its institutions because they will all be swept away when Christ, Christ returns, as he will control the world. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world, because he would eventually, after his suffering, begin, become the king of the world. The world today is largely unaware of the influence of these frog-like spirits. So comparing Israel with Europe, what do we get? As we have seen, Europe with its human rights its democracy, its freedom and its Catholic influence has done its best to destroy, adulterate and change God's words of the Bible and the purpose of God in burning Bibles or altering them to their own ideas. They believe that the kingdom spoken about in scripture is the one controlled by them, the world of today. So how could they have any interest in a kingdom controlled by anyone else but themselves? The Pope believes he is in the place of Christ, consequently their attitude to Israel is very poor, and they condemn them as much as possible. The United Nations with their human rights influences everything they do. There are 193 members in the United Nations General Assembly, and the great majority of their edicts are specifically against Israel. The European Court of Human Rights similarly clings to man's idea of justice within this system. So moving again to Israel, we know from Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 12 that God's eyes are always upon the land of Israel, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. Israel today is progressing with its inventions, its massive rise in military and environmental technology, its oil, its computer technology, its agriculture and its diamonds, along with its increasing relationships with many nations, even with Putin of Russia, who is now the most powerful man in the world. And then there's Donald Trump, who thinks he's the most powerful man in the world. He actually signed a decree to move the US Embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. We read therefore in Joel 3 verse 1, which has a better translation from the Amplified Bible, In those days, this is God speaking, In those days and at that time when I shall reverse the captivity and restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. So that is what's happening today. The times of the Gentiles have just about been fulfilled. The declaration of the State of Israel was made. In June 1967, the city of Jerusalem was recaptured by Israeli troops and now that progress is continued by the moving of the US Embassy to Jerusalem. This gives it the legitimate position of capital of Israel, which it always has been for the last 3,000 years, ever since King David took it. But the surrounding Arabs have told so many lies and half-truths that many in the world believe them. They even tried to change history. But the world is now beginning to realise what's been going on. 
The action of moving the US Embassy to Jerusalem caused much opposition and resistance from Europe. The Pope believed the Arab lies, as it was in his interests, and cried out against this move. So we can see today the animosity of Europe and many other nations towards Israel, largely because of Europe's false ideas of human rights and their false religion in believing that the Pope is there in place of Christ, which is blasphemy. The only human right man has is the right to die, because everything he has is a gift from God, even life himself, and he has no rights at all but to serve him, to serve God. We know that to some extent Israel is a God-fearing nation as their whole history has been inspired to the prophets by God who wrote them down for those who would come later to read and understand. We can see Israel's morality in the fact that they helped those who are their enemies. They cared for the Syrian refugees who asked for help. They sell electricity to those who live in Gaza and don't pay their bills who use their electricity to build rockets to shoot, shoot back at them, and many other things. Also, Israeli ingenuity is responsible for some of the world's most amazing medical and other advances. Now they've found oil, which has contributed to some nations becoming more friendly to them. So we can see that there is a period of peace and safety coming upon Israel today. However, in Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3, during this period of peace and safety, we read, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. This will be when Russia and Europe, along with many other countries, will swoop down and evade Israel in order to take a great spoil. So once again, we come back to Ezekiel 38, and verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people, against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, as we have seen, and they shall dwell safely all of them. Thou, that is Gog and others, shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. It will be during that short time of war that those who attack Israel will all be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ, who will have returned to the earth along with his resurrected servants. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 2 tells us that God will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women rubbished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So many will go into captivity but many will escape, some to Jordan and some to other areas. The return of Christ at that time will be a great shock to the world. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. The spoiler, the extortioner, the Russian and European armies will be destroyed. Israel will recover and the prophet Elijah will go out to all countries to bring their scattered Jews back to Jerusalem as they will be persecuted because of the destruction of the Russian and European armies. This will then constitute the second exodus back to the land of Israel. When Christ returns, the whole world will begin to change. We read in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. And verse 4, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be his girdle, the girdle of his loins. 
and faithfulness to girdle up his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. We need to think about these things, as we can already see that without any shadow of a doubt, it is coming to pass at this moment. We need to read the Bible and pray for God to help and guide us to become his servants and help the Lord Jesus in his kingdom and live in peace forever. Christ will begin his rule from Jerusalem and Israel will become the leader of the world. Under his